from one of Western Australia's most spectacular and unique tourist destinations, welcome to Broome and a special Out Down edition of Paul Murray Live. G'day Australia, happy Sunday wherever you happen to be. Welcome to one of the most magical places we have ever taken Paul Murray Live. This is Broome in Western Australia. The nearest town is a thousand kilometres away. This is about as remote as Australia can get. But I tell you what, the history that you are about to see for the next couple of hours is an endless celebration of the spirit that turns the red earth into a city, into an icon. And one of the things is this very building. I wanted to show you this before we show you anything else here in Broome. This joint is called Sun Pictures. This is a place that started uh, in the very early 1900s as, uh, well, anything from um, um, a house of leisure, let's put it that way, to uh, a Chinese theatre. And then about uh, 1916, it became a movie theatre. But it's a movie theatre with a difference. Let me show you. This joint's got a tin roof and no insulation because it's half indoors, it's half outdoors. It is alfresco movies way before the wankers came up with bean bags and, you know, quinoa dip, if that's a thing. But all of the projectors are ones that have been used here over the years, from the silent ones through to the latest digital, from King Kong to Gone with the Wind, from Toy Story to Titanic, it's all been seen here. But the biggest show of all, well, it's Paul Murray Live, right now in Broome. It's the bucket list destination at the top end of Western Australia. Home to pristine beaches and rugged outback, Broome is just one of those places you have to see to believe. Our town is all about showcasing the great towns around this country and what makes Australia the best joint in the world. So tonight, we head to the beach. This town was founded back in the 1880s for the glistening, shining pearl. Originally used for buttons and fine cutlery, broom pearls can now be found around the world fetching tens of thousands of dollars. Broom's story is forever intertwined with pearling and now boasts a booming tourism industry. The year-long warm weather means a very warm welcome for anyone from around the world when they get here. And there is no bigger attraction here in Broome than the famed Cable Beach. 22 kilometres of pristine white sand edge right by the Indian Ocean. The beach got its name from the telegraph cable that was laid between Broome and Java in 1889, connecting Australia to the rest of the world. This tropical oasis is known for a slower pace of life. The locals affectionately call it Broome time. So let's make the most of our moment here where the red dirt meets the ocean. Tonight, our town is Broome. few firsts tonight. All right, it's the first time I think a television show has come from a place like this and it's the first time a fat bloke's been able to wear shorts on Sky News. So you're here on a wonderful night. Thank you for having us here in Broome. A couple of people who, uh, and you've got to see in a second, uh, my day at the races, that was magnificent. Uh, I think I was drunk just being near everyone who was there. It was a fantastic event. But I want to talk to some people. One has been around for a while, one has just popped into the joint, uh, about how amazing not just this particular theatre is and our location tonight, but Broome is the our town. Let's start with Jodie. Jodie, good evening to you. How long have you been in Broome? Um, back for six months, so a year in total. Very cool. All right. Well, what, what, what is it uh, that, uh, that, that brings you here, that keeps you here, that means you want to build a life here? Uh, my, that would be my partner. I'm... Hi, doll. How are you? Hi. Well, you can take a pick in the, out the back. All right. And uh, what do you want to do here? What do you do want to do with your time here? Um, well, obviously, this place is amazing and it either sucks you in or it spits you out. And <laughs> um, I have my own business here as well, which helps. Well, feel free to plug it. You're on national uh, television. OK, it's Natural Healing by Jodie, and I do uh, psychic readings and also Reiki and spiritual advisor. Very good. Well, hopefully my aura is not too uncomfortable because I have got the shorts on right now, but it's lovely to see you. All right, uh, and let's have a chat to Peter. G'day, mate. You've been around, what, for 49 years? 49 years in Broome, yeah. Oh, and I love it. So tell me, uh, is, is this the place you go to the movies or the sort of more modern ones up the road? No, nah, this is where we all went to the movies in the old days. Um, I personally used to go two to three times a week. Um, 
there was, this was before television yeah. and before Sky. Oh, gee. <laughs> and please tell me, just as a dirty cigar smoker, mm. you've been able just to light one up here. This, oh. this would have been fun when, when you could smoke and watch the movies half indoors, half outdoors. In the old days, you could smoke anywhere, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and if you know the right people, you still can in a place like Broome. <laughs> What, uh, what, what keeps you here apart from, uh, apart from family? What is it about this place and broom time? How do you keep a life going at broom time pace? Because there's sleep, island time, <laughs> and then broom time. <laughs> oh, well, look, I, I first come in here to, um, well, I guess to make my fortune, uh, and I fell in love with the place, and it's just a lifestyle that uh, I haven't been able to find or see anywhere else. Uh, I've brought my whole family up here, six kids. Um, the majority of them are still here with, with me, here working. Um, it's just a place that, that, that you love. Now, the Broom Cup, uh, I'd heard many stories. I know that there are people that are, you know, big race fans, but you don't even have to care about the GGs to enjoy this. Have you gone many times? You've learnt your lesson and only a couple of times. What, how often does the Broom Cup do it for you? In the old days, it was every broom cup. As I've got older, uh, I've got to kind of keep an eye on my health. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a young man's game, and I can tell you what, as I said, uh, it was one heck of a day, if for no other reason. This weekend, next year, book it now. You've got to go to the broom cup. If you think the Melbourne Cup, whatever. The broom cup is the one that should stop the nation. It certainly stopped us right in our tracks and it was freaking awesome. Enjoy our day at the Cup. Welcome to the Broom Turf Club. Get ready for the 127th running of the world famous Broom Cup. I have no idea why I'm talking like a race caller, but you've got to, because I'm very excited. 2,200 metres, $120,000 prize money, 7,000 people, 7 billion beers. It's a very fancy occasion, this one. Let's go racing! So those blokes that you just saw who looked all super serious, I thought they were watching a race. Would it be Caulfield? Would it be the Gold Coast? Rose Hill? No, they're watching the footy. gorgeous sun hat. Her bag is by Anna Pell and her pearls from Hass Paley. Better every year? Uh, no, probably not because I'm getting older. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I think you are fashions on the field. Look at this from top to bottom. You are the killer. Look at the Melbourne Cup. It's just, it's just sprayed on his eyes. <laughs> Tip for the cup. Ooh. Number six. All right. Number six. Any reason or are you just like number six? Well, I've on number six this one. By the cup time comes round, it should be good again. <laughs> I don't know who's going to win the broom cup? You <laughs> fine, <laughs> Boys, get around him. He's trying to peg the margin back. Down on the inside, Swift Platinum. Boys, get around him. Won't get to him. A great ride. And goes home to win the Cup, Swift Platinum. And Swift Platinum wins the Broom Cup. $120,000. And look at the crowd. Half of them didn't even watch the race because they are enjoying the UDLs, the anything in a tin. If you get the chance... You've got to come to a race meeting like this. You've got to go as far out of the main cities as possible. And I tell you what, Broom at sunset is awesome. Congratulations. What does it feel like to win the Broom Cup? Oh, it's a huge, oh, it's an unbelievable feeling. Um, it's something that you probably want to tick off your bucket list as a jockey. And um, I can, you know, proudly say thank you to Peter for trusting me with the big grey. And, yeah, what more can you say? For, for those that are watching us, Sydney, Melbourne or something like that, what's it like to race on a track like this? Oh, it's, um, 
it's pretty hard. Like uh, you, you do get a fair bit of kickback, but um, you probably just got to go with it. And you know, if you get dirty, you get dirty. That's the whole part of it. <laughs> Congratulations, Peter. How does it feel, mate? Oh, absolutely sensational. I've been coming up here for 30 odd years trying to win one of these cups, and uh, finally got one. What does that feel like? As you say, a lifetime of trying, yeah, and here we go. A lifetime of you know doing my best, trying to get there, and you finally get there. It's it's a pretty good feeling, yeah. And just because the racing's over doesn't mean the fun has to stop. Welcome to partying broom style. Wow, well, broom, you did it very well. to uh, tip off the senses, but I'm not entirely sure that we pixelated anything in that last image. <laughs> well done to our production team. Now, by the way, I should give an early plug for tomorrow night's show. There is so much more footage from the Broom Cup, and we will show you plenty more tomorrow night. That is, well, the celebration side of things. So a lot more fun from the Broom Cup tomorrow night, but let's talk to three blokes who know the racing industry incredibly well and know how important uh, yesterday was for the region, for the city, and obviously the, uh, the horse racing business in particular. Uh, Mike Wendell is the, uh, well, the bookie of most resort here. The man who's been around... <laughs> Pardon me. I need a glass of water because I had some popcorn just before we were talking, and now I'm joking. So, Mike, G'day, Paul. there we go. My apologies. You are, uh, you've, of course, been the bookie uh, and been so for 40 years here. Uh, we've also got uh, George Manning, who is the race caller uh, last hey. night, uh, yesterday. Peter Taylor from the Chamber of Commerce. Gentlemen, hello. All right. Um, give me a round of applause because I need this glass of water as fast <laughs> as possible. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> George, you know that experience where you just go, I can normally push through, I but popcorn do. on that part of the throat, no chance. <laughs> no chance at all. Rather you than me. No chance, so I apologise. All right, Mike, um, how many cups have you, have, have, have you been through? Uh, yesterday was uh, my 40th cup. Fantastic. All right, have you seen it change over the years? Oh, look, it's incredible. I came here in 1980. Uh, we had 16 horses here, and I thought, gosh, that's a lot of horses in one race. Unfortunately, it was 16 horses for the whole day. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we might get 300 people. It's 400. Uh, so times have definitely changed. So I, I don't want to get too crass about money, but essentially, is, is this the pinnacle? This is where if you're going to make the most, you're going to make it most uh, at the Broom Cup each and every year? Oh, Cup days are, are definitely our busiest days. We only, we only race nine days a year, 1st of June till the 17th of August. So uh, yeah, we just got to uh, make the most of it. Now, on a, on a race day like uh, on a race day like yesterday, um, lots of small bets. Does somebody surprise you with just you know somebody who will walk up not quite looking like they're going to pull out hundreds, but they do? Uh, they do indeed, especially on Cup Day, and it's people you've never seen before. There was one guy. I bet it there. wasn't the bloke in the pineapple shirt. No, there's a guy there in the green shirt, older gentleman with uh, scruffy hair. Looked like he'd just come from the beach. He said, I'll have 1,300 on that, please. Oh. And I, where did he come from? Anyway, he's a barrister from Melbourne. Oh, isn't he? But he certainly didn't look it at the races. <laughs> he was his true self of which he couldn't fight, which I like. George, what's it like to, uh, to, to, to call a, a country race meeting like this and to have those words heard all over the country with the Broom Cup and potentially even internationally? OK, well, actually, I'm not the race caller. I'm more the course spruker. Right, OK. So I, uh, I tell people uh, the first and second calls are betting, and I uh, try and reunite parents with their lost children. Excellent. You know, all, all that sort of thing, Pete. So how did you go yesterday when the tote went down? That's not a great moment. I mean, it's good for you because you're, no. uh, you're on the course, but what's it like when the tote goes down in the middle of the broom car? As it did yesterday, that was because there was just so many people, you know, and our infrastructure can only take so much. But um, when that happens, the first and only thing you can do really is to apologise, yeah. say it's going to come back on as quickly as possible, and uh, then direct everybody to the bookies. Well, I've never seen so, so many people attack so few bookies. Well, this is it. What was that like when, when all, all, all the you know, uh, computer stuff's down, they've got to come see yeah. the bloke with the bag? You should organise yeah. it more often. <laughs> yeah, bring your own bag. <laughs> be, that's the only way to do it for the races. 
Mm. Now, uh, also, I, uh, now I have to apologise for the tote because my boss, Boris, um, he was probably quite responsible for that. He was betting all over the shop. Did very well in the end, of course. Yeah. But, mate, he was everywhere yesterday. He was across every single race that was yeah. around. He yeah. came good and we had a very good end towards uh, the Cup and was able to see our mate Jerry Harvey mm -hmm. presenting at the end of the day, which is yeah, very which cool. Is what does it mean in dollars to have an event like this, a marquee event where, I mean, it's magical where, to the younger generation, everything about this place is Instagrammable straight away. Yep. Uh, to people who have looked forward to coming here, there's a real sort of adult bucket list thing. What does it do for the economy, the Broom Cup, every Look, year? Obviously, it's our greatest showcase of the year. It's the largest event. We have thousands and thousands of people coming. On that day, there was about 8,000 people, which is half the population of Broome. Fantastic. So we've got people coming from all over Australia and people all over Australia actually watching it. So it's the best showcase we've possibly got. But it's this thing where, I mean, the, 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 the location of the course, and again, you don't even have to be that into horse racing. You don't have to wake up or, or fall asleep to a racing dream, depending on which way you, you are. By the way, that show's back in the next couple of weeks. Uh, looking forward to celebrating the Everest. Good bit of telly. Um, but just the, the location of it, because yep. this is the thing where, for, for people like me from the other side of the country, the idea of being able to see the red dirt into the race course, into the water, is just an, a, a, an amazing visual yeah, spectacle. Yes, and that's that thing where, I mean, you never take it for granted after 40 years, do you? No, you don't. <laughs> no, you, you can't, can you, after a while, with things like well, that? Well, we did win uh, approximately 10 years ago now. We, we were, oh, sorry, I say win, we second best race course in the world. Wow. Location-wise. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, now, yeah. now, also, just, just for those that, I mean, uh, Jerry Harvey was explaining to me with great detail, and he'll be on the show with Katie Page in a couple of minutes' time. Uh, they're doing something very special. But he was explaining to me <clears> that in the old days, a track like that, they'd have an awful lot of oil, literally, in it. Yep. Um, is that changing? Is there a little bit of an experiment that's happening here in Broome? Yeah, we're using far less oil, um, and we're being a lot smarter with the way we use it and the way that we employ people to keep that track up to scratch. We try to get the track to be as close to a turf track as possible. So that the top's got about 50 millimetres of give in it, which is about what you get on a turf track. And, uh, and that, if you can get that consistency right around the course, you've got a very good track. Like Darwin, you know they run phenomenal times at Darwin. That's a sand track, this is a pin down track. But there's one point I've got to make. Many people who don't live in Broome don't realise this. In 2000, we had a, cyc a cyclone, Cyclone Rosita, and it blew the track away. Wow. All that was left was the track. Like the infrastructure, everything was gone. And if you looked over the other side of the track towards Ganthian Point yesterday, that's where all the horses, all the stabling staff, trainers, they all lived for three months. That was obliterated. And we had to rebuild that in six weeks. How'd you do it? Where does the cash come from? How do you pull that together? We're very, very lucky with insurance. And we had a, a very, very good insurance representative who got us the ga cash pretty quick. Yeah. That we had a lot of uh, freebie help from the contractors and those who, who expected to be paid charged, you know, minimal rates. Now, now I'm going to ask everyone uh, this question yeah. all the way through the night, right? Broom time just means relaxed, OK? But I want to ask all of you what broom time means to you. Mike? Well, when I uh, came here in the 80s, uh, I had a restaurant called Swindles, and uh, it, the, everything used to close uh, half past one in the <laughs> afternoon and open again at three o'clock. Or it might, might be one till 3.30. Yeah. Something like that. So that was broom time. So you walk down Chinatown, there was no shops anywhere else in those yeah. days, and uh, they were all locked up and closed. That's a good definition of broom time. What was it for you? Broom time is just, you actually have to learn to live with it. It takes time, but you've just got to relax back into broom. Yeah. Nothing happens quickly, but that's fine. That's how we like it. <laughs> that's, that's right, George, isn't it? Just nothing it happens is. quickly, but that's the way we it like is. it. And don't look at your watch. Forget about that. If you've got to be somewhere like this evening coming on this show... Well, you know, you don't have to be there exactly at that time. You get there when you get there. <laughs> and, and here we are. On the behalf of my producers, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, the show will start and end when it does. Fine by me. I'm happy to go to Broom Time in the next little while. Apologies yeah. to you, Peter Credlin, and all the rest. Don't worry, I'm just going <laughs> to pop on now for Broom Time. All right, give it up for these lads and everyone who was involved with the Broom Cup. Very good. Thank you very much, lads. Do appreciate it. Now... 
the beautiful Jessica Malboy is one of the absolute legends of the Australian uh, music industry. She's a lady who knows the North very well because, of course, she's from this half of the country. Uh, this is actually a place that is incredibly special to her, a movie that she starred in that did uh, big business and made big news for her. Well, it was actually launched here, and instead of having a red carpet, they had the red sand that they put down as the carpet. Here is a wonderful way of celebrating Broom. But tonight, we'll talk acting in a second, but let's hear her sing as well. The song is called Little Things. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, thanks to the wonderful people of Sony Music. She'll have an album out in October. Live in Broom is Jessica Malboy. You don't see him pretty Not like you used to And I never admit it I'm trying so hard for you But all of the moments are treasure In the morning you won't remember Don't know why you keep this together long enough to try I make big things out of little things and I watch you keep missing them you don't get why it's killing me every time you mess this up send myself on fire to keep us warm swear I lose my mind watching you The little things mean so much more So no, I'm not finished <laughs> Don't look at me crazy I hate when you say things you don't mean Just cause you're angry Harvey Norman, shop with confidence. Need advice? We're here to help. Welcome back to the Sun Pictures Palace here. Um, I hope that you get the chance to come here. I had the chance to be here uh, with the family for the past few days, and honestly, sunrise, sunset, staircase to the moon, 
We're going to tell you a lot about it. We're going to show you the stuff that's going to be mouth-watering. I'm not joking. To be here physically, something very, very different. I don't think I've ever had the experience with Staircase to the Moon. And I've got to show you this in a couple of minutes' time, where thousands of people are all standing on the, the foreshore to watch the rising of the moon, and they do it in silence. I mean, it's not like the moon can hear them and is not going to do it, but they're all just sitting there, and it's a magical moment. You'll see it on the telly in a couple of seconds' time, so don't go anywhere. I promise you, you're going to want to see that. One of the main industries here, and it has had one heck of a story, is the pearling industry in this place for a very long time. And let's have a look at uh, the pearling history of beautiful Broome. Broome wouldn't be Broome. It was our way of life. It was a, a boom industry. It's um, an inspiring, pioneering story and uh, a beautiful product. Broome was built on pearls. The late 1800s, an era obsessed with the white gem. The families had a long association with the town and the community of Broome, and not least of all, uh, through pearling. Kim Mao's grandfather co-owned one of the first pearling companies, which kick-started the local industry. They came down here in 1878 and late in the year and took shelter in Roebuck Bay. And in 1879, they had some trial dives off Ganthian Point and found good beds of shell there and never went any further. It was a time when Broome was not only rich in pearls, but rich in multiculturalism. The allure of working as a pearl diver, bringing an array of cultures into the remote northwest. It was a town like no other. Before 1955, it was still manned with the skeleton crew of very old Malay and Indonesian men. Yeah, not more than six luggers. Pearl Hamaguchi's family have been in Broome since the industry first began. Her late husband owned his own pearling company. When my husband came, he still inherited the method they were diving in the 1930s, the hard end. Oh my God, he thought, what have I got myself into? He knew the pearling grounds because he was doing it, you know, all along the 80 mile beach and you know, all this coast, you know. So he wasn't learning from scratch. He knew where exactly the pearling grounds were. Four of Pearl's sons were divers at a time when it was impossible to contact those out at sea. Did you ever worry about your sons when they were diving? I did, yeah. But I didn't show it. I'd sort of discard that worry because that's how you had to live. It was a risky job. Sharks, storms and divers palsy, just some of the threats to those working on pearling boats. There's always the risk of um, getting nitrogen in the blood and, uh, and having a bend when diving without uh, controlled regulation. In the town's cemetery, 700 headstones, representing the more than 900 Japanese lives lost in the dangerous line of work. But for many, the rarity of the prize was worth the risk. They are the only gem that comes from a living animal and also the only gem that's sold in that primary form. So the fact that they're not altered by man. But it's not just the pearl itself which attracted divers from around the world. Before culturing techniques were introduced, it wasn't enough pearls to be an industry on its own. They were very valuable and if they were found it was, you know, a great thing. But it wasn't what the backbone of the industry was built on and that was the mother of pearl. In the early 1900s, Broome supplied 80% of the world's mother of pearl, which was commonly used to create buttons. Now only four companies in the region still harvest the natural wonder. Pearls found naturally around Broome are some of the largest in the world, but companies eventually turned to cultivating perfect pearls to meet demand. $50 to $60 for a smaller low-grade pearl through to the sky's the limit, you know, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for those really rare, large, perfectly round, fine quality pearls. The local industry now relies heavily on tourism, 
Thousands of travellers visit the few surviving pearl farms each year. But the pearling industry is still deeply embedded in Broome's history and will never be removed. It makes me feel part of the town, yeah, it makes me feel part of the town, which um, uh, I'm very fond of and, uh, you know, uh, something I could never get out of me. People like me, we have an eye for a pearl that is produced in brew. I can tell. I can tell. So many stories that are intertwined that are both positive and heartbreaking about the pearl industry here. And one of the companies that does great work is, uh, is Wiley Creek. And uh, Kalina Brammer joins us now. How are you? Very well, thank you. Very good. Well, from the necklace to the earrings, all the rest of it here, how long have you loved pearls? I have been with Willie Creek for about five years, but my love of pearls started well before that. All right, now I need to know about uh, the biggest day. Have you ever had somebody who's rolled into town, some big swinging whatever, from, and just turned around and has bought half the shop? Somebody who just gets uh, <laughs> some yank who turns in and goes, This is awesome, I'll have one of that, 15 of everything, thanks. We have plenty of those people that come through. Apologies half the to time Americans, I don't know what that accent was, <laughs> but there we go. <laughs> Oh, half the time they're joking, but you never know. Um, everybody comes to Broome because they either have that love for pearls or it is on their bucket list yeah. and they always want to come and, and, yeah, take home a pearl. Now, tell me the story of Willie Creek. So, Willie Creek is a family-owned business. We've been in a business for 30 years and we're celebrating it this year, which is fantastic. Um, we have the Pearl Farm, which is 38 kilometres out of Broome. Uh, we also have a number of showrooms in Broome itself and also down in Perth. Um, it's just a great, a great vibe, and we tell the story of the pearl from the shell to the showroom. So it's this thing where, so all of this is local, right? Every single one of the pearls from your earrings, uh, the, the, what, your, your rings, everything, <laughs> right? Everything, all right? Uh, um, you know, you've got a toe ring, it's yeah. fantastic. Everything, uh, you've even got a pearl tattoo. Yeah. Um, all of this is local. It is. It is all local. There are pearls from all over the world, but we focus here on the Australian South Sea cultured pearl. So how long does the process go from finding to being able to sell one? So from actually creating the pearl, it takes two years to create a pearl. Uh, once we have that cultured pearl, we then send it down to our jewellers who can set it. So we could harvest a pearl on a pearl farm tour today and a jeweller could have it set into a piece of jewellery for us tomorrow. Very impressive. It All is. Right. It's this thing where, I mean, they're beautiful, they're classic, never go out of style, all the rest of it here. Um, now, I notice, obviously, because there's been such a rich history here, there's so many different companies. This is a town that doesn't have six million people living in it. Um, is there enough business to go around? There is plenty. Broome's a very transient town, and we do focus on tourism. So, um, during that peak time of year, from April through till September, October, uh, there's a multitude of people that come through every year, and they're looking to enjoy a bit of good old Broome time. Um, there's some that come back every year, and those that come for the pearls. Well, you've got to my last question. What does Broome time mean? to you. Broom time to me. Take a step back, relax and just enjoy life. Well, we've done it for a couple of days and I hope a lot of people watching uh, do right now. Give it up not just uh, for uh, the pearl industry but obviously Kalina as well. Thank you very much. No do worries. appreciate it. Thank you. Willie Creek is the company. Again, I mean, places like this is the best thing about being able to immerse ourselves here for not just these couple of days, but the few weeks beforehand, and, and thanks to Harvey Norman and what the work that they do with the CWA and so many others, there's quite a tale uh, that'll be here after our involvement here, but you get to learn again about all these different little bits of history, including the military history of this particular part of Australia that has one heck of a connection to the bombings in World War II. Have a look. Tuesday, March 3rd, 1942, a rare home front experience of war. It was terrible because they had to pick the mothers and babies up off the beach. Broome, the target of a devastating Japanese air raid. During World War II, Japanese forces had begun occupying Kopang on the island of Timor. Nine Japanese Zero fighters departed the area at 7.05 a.m. Two and a half hours later, they arrived over Roebuck Bay and attacked without warning. At least 22 Allied aircraft, mostly Dutch Dorniers and Catalinas, were destroyed. Not a single operational aircraft was left in Broome. 
The bombing of Broome was the second greatest loss of life on Australian soil. It is believed at least 89 people died, mostly Dutch women and children who just fled Java after the fall of Singapore, along with American, British, Dutch, Indian and Japanese military personnel. The wreckages of Catalina flying boats remain on the seabed to this day, still visible on extreme low tides. Our thanks to Emily Evans, who is helping to tell our story this evening and the story of Broome. I also have to give a massive thanks to all of the people who make this happen. This does not just happen by luck. All of the technical crew who uh, literally from all over the country come to make this thing happen. It's pretty amazing as anyone who gets to see one of these things live. And also our many, many corporate partners. Uh, you know our associations with so many of them. Australia Post, absolutely front and centre, is one of the great pillars of how we're able to do our town tonight in Broome. Table Beach, you must see this with your own eyes to be able to see it at sunrise, sunset, whatever it happens to be. Have a look at this. Again, uh, one of our bosses just went for a little walk. Funnily enough, an awful lot of people wanted to come to Broome for the out town this time. A very big crew that we brought to us. He just went for a little leisurely stroll. Ended up doing the full 22 kilometres up and down, uh, of course, along the Indi Indian Ocean. Named, as we told you a bit before, about that international uh, telegraph cable between Broome and Java, late in 1889. Uh, and camel rides. Now, this is when the kids are here. Camel rides, trike rides, all of that stuff uh, is awesome. And I've got to say, and I don't know if the Broom Tourism Board will like me saying this, but as a Broom Broom Bogan, I loved driving our rental car on the beach. I'm pretty sure I didn't sign for that. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get in trouble for that. But it was freaking awesome. The ability to drive on a beach can happen. PC does not live on Cable Beach. And if it does, it wasn't watching while I was doing donuts. Not joking. <laughs> donuts in a Kia. Who knew it could be done? But apparently it can be done right here at Cable Beach. Now, before we have a chat to uh, two of our favourite people who are so important to what we do here with our town and also uh, retail right around the country, they do an awful lot to help so many different causes. And Harvey Norman, front and centre yet again, particularly when it comes to the Paralympics. Have a look. Unstoppable and going for gold. Australia's Paralympic athletes counting down to the Tokyo 2020 Games. I think it's the most consistent training we've ever had in a cycle. I've been living in, in Sydney since just before Rio, so it's been a really good run this time around. I think we've made massive gains, we've made some few changes, and now we're at that point where we're just looking for the one percenters. I have an incredible performance team. Madison Di Rosario knows all too well the tough and gruelling road to be fit for the para-athletics team. At just 14, she was the youngest on the 2008 squad for Beijing. It was a really, really big surprise at the time. I was training with the big plan being London 2012. I was, I was 14 in, in 08, but a, a spot opened up on the relay team that they were trying to fill, and we were one of the last few athletes selected to, to fill that spot. It was there she won silver in the 4 by 100 metre relay event, Maddie then went on to win two silver medals at the Rio Paralympics and gold at the World Championships. Louise Savage is a wheelchair racer and now leading coach. We have a really good relationship, so it does work well. Um, we work on a lot of honesty, so we haven't got time to mess around. And, you know, what needs to be said is said. Um, but, yeah, we have a good relationship in terms of setting our goals and trying to achieve them and why we're doing sessions. So there's a lot of understanding there. As one of Australia's greatest Paralympians of all time, Louise is passing her knowledge on to the next generation. Things are a lot different now than they were when I was an athlete, so it's great to see the um, evolution of the sport and also the athletes and the su support that they get, but um, you know, I love it. I love being involved still in my chosen sport, so that's probably the best thing. And a new partnership will help our athletes evolve. For me, Harvey's is a great people's brand, and the Australian Paralympic team is certainly a people's team. They're one that all Australians can and should be proud of. Harvey Norman is a strong supporter of the athletes and juniors. 
The partnership is about ensuring the spotlight on Paralympians shines a bit brighter. We know from history that in previous games there's a lot of um, people out there, particularly young kids with a disability, who don't even realise that they can play sport, let alone that there's a pathway that they could see them one day ending up representing Australia. We've been thrilled with um, Harvey's coming on board because that actually supports our ability to not only get the team to Tokyo but to certainly expose it and give it greater profile. <laughs> How good are the Paralympians and how good is Harvey Norman? And there's no Harvey Norman without Katie Page and Jerry Harvey. Give it up there here in Broome. Thank you. Now, now listen, yeah. right, have you only got one shirt? I, yeah, I'm sorry, I right. only got this. This was the Broom Cup yesterday. Yeah, I know. I'm Are you a, on Broom Time? I am on Broom Time. I'm completely there. I, I didn't get changed last night. I had dinner in this last night. I had smoked my cigars in this. It was just a, a slip, didn't it? Jerry, are you on Broom Time? I, I bought a, You're I'm, looking a bit formal. I, I bought a pup out of that shirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's legal it's somewhere. After it's been washed. You know. <laughs> now, Cable Beach, yep. you, know, you guys are super busy running the business, doing everything around the country. So you decide, OK, we're going to come. Yep. This will be great. Um, and then you go for the drive. You go for the drive on Cable Beach. Yep. Not quite as romantic as you may have hoped. OK, the Jeep's there. I went for a bit of a spin this morning. Jerry got jealous, said, let's go for a spin. I said, I did some wheelies, great. Jerry got bogged, did not move, <laughs> but he got bogged next to the camels, right? <laughs> so here we've got 12 camels, people waiting, and Jerry's bogged, can't drive a car. So then the camel leader has to help Jerry get the car going. Everyone's paid a lot of money, Jerry, to be hang on, on those camels. On. That camel driver came over. And, and he said, what do you think you're doing? You know, I, I said, mate, you get in and do a better job, right? <laughs> so he said, OK. So he gets in. I said, mate, you're not doing too good. And I'll get it right, I'll get it right. He didn't. And then another bloke walked over. I said, mate, what do you do? He said, I'm a mechanic. I said, camel driver, get out. <laughs> right? So the camel driver got out. I said, mate, you stick to looking after camels, OK? <laughs> this bloke's a mechanic. The mechanic gets in, gets her going in a flash. I'm in there. Then I take Katie out to do a couple of wheelies. And she says, stop it, stop it. Do I said, not do wheelies with hey, Hang on, I said, this is not drive. very dangerous. Okay? You're a bad no, driver. I know that, but you... <laughs> I know that. I know. But, but, you, but you still thought, I, you know you're a bad driver, but you're going to try and do doughies. I've taken the, the, the missus out and I'm going to do a couple of wheelies. Oh, how very... she, she... I can do them, he's not allowed. Okay. <laughs> Next question. That's the very modern partnership, I like it. It is. No, so I, I just... Mm. Thumb on top. Now, as, as a racing man, though, how did you feel about uh, the Broom Cup and being there yesterday? I, the, the Broom Cup, the, it's a wonderful thing. All over Australia, you have these country race meetings. And in every country town, it's the, uh, it's the big event of the year. And, and to get 8,000 people at a Broom Cup, there's days when you're flat out getting that at a Sydney Saturday race meeting. Good point. Right? So to get that number at a Broom Cup, I know race meetings in, in Sydney and Melbourne sometimes that say, I want, I want the Broome uh, Cup crowd here. So, but it doesn't happen just in Broome. It happens in lots of country towns. And it's a lifeblood. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a celebration time for racing and for people and all the people get dressed up and... And it brings the town to life and it brings a lot of people... Well, hang on, how do you go about me only having one shirt? Has he only got one shirt? Yeah, As a matter of fact, he has only one shirt. <laughs> and um, it's we a have different this shirt. Issue. It's not the same he, shirt. He has trouble using a washing machine. <laughs> he can sell so a washing machine, he but he doesn't know how to use it. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you know the thing about the Broom Cup that we what? haven't got at Magic Millions? Yeah. The undie race. Yeah, we're not I think we've got to add the. Oh, race. come on! Okay, come yeah, well, I on, want Jerry. some of the Broom Cup no, crowd come there. On. Let's come on. Let's let's get some of the blokes that'll drop their dacks. Maybe yeah. we can do it the Sunday before. Let me say this: if you come, mate, and you drop yours, okay, oh. I'll drop mine. Right? <laughs> oh, no, if that's no. something you'd pay to see, ladies and gentlemen. What? The answer is no. <laughs> this is, this is oh. a celebration of the Australian man. Yeah, correct. Wow. Jerry and Paul. That'll pack them out. Let, let, let's just assume you and I have got a 
tiny little bit of reputation left. This will completely destroy <laughs> anything. I mean, we'll make Alan James look like a bloody hero. <laughs> what if we can get Alan to come with us and do it? Yes. Yeah, we'll yeah. get Alan Ray, we'll all drop our hat yeah, and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. All right, just an idea. Breaking news. I think we've got yeah. that at the bottom of the screen now. Right. Katie, uh, back to the Paralympics, though. Let's make this uh, yeah. back about why you're supporting them. We saw what uh, Louise and others have had to say. Um, what is it about the Paralympics? We've done it for a long time, and the Paralympians never get any money, right? So, so Jerry and I very much want to help so many people that don't get the money. And, you know, the work that we're doing with CWA with you, it's the same. And the CWA get to choose who they support because they know how to do it best, we don't. But the Paralympians are the same. I mean, you saw that footage and it just brings tears to my eyes. It's, they are extraordinary athletes. And the fact that it's part of the Olympics now too, which is a recent thing, as you know. Yeah. Um, Tokyo next year will be fantastic. Lynn Anderson, who's the CEO, is a mate. I've known her for a long time. She does a great job. Um, what we do is so small in comparison to what a lot of other people do, but at least we're giving a hand. The footprint of your business, which, of course, starts in Sydney and now stretches as far as Broome in Western Australia, Singapore, so much more. When you look back just over, over your life and the life of this business, what does it mean to you that, that this thing that you've put so much into didn't just spread beyond your own home city but is in a place like Broome? It becomes front and centre of the retail experience and people knowing that they can get exactly the same service, exactly the same products as if they walked into one right in the middle of Melbourne. I think, I think Jerry's story on Broome is the best and how we've ended up in Broome. Well, I, we're in pretty much every town in Australia and New Zealand and, and uh, we've got 20,000 people work for us across the world and we've just come back from Ireland and Slovenia and Croatia where we've got lots of shops and um, I, I was with Katie on a little thing up here about six years ago and I, we had to go back to Sydney and I, I had to stay here for three hours and I said, oh, well, I'll grab a cab and I rem quickly went round anyone that had a furniture or electrical shop in town and just said, if you ever want to sell out, I'll probably buy it. <laughs> and then two years later, one of them rang up and said, OK, I'm ready. So we, that's got us into Broome. And, um, and now... Um, we're doing really well in Broome. It's yeah. a good little town, and um, and I've got two really good people here running it, and uh, and and it's you know it's just like a lot of other country towns. It's good. What's this thing? I mean, Katie as well. Uh, your call and the best call of the our town was to go. Let's partner up with CWA. Mm -hmm. Well over two hundred thousand dollars, and today we take it even further, and we'll get to that. Million. It's okay. pretty yep. amazing, isn't it? Yeah where that amount of money to, as you say, those women in those communities, and it can be as small as a fuel card, footy boots in Toowoomba, you name it. That's what I love about the CWA, and you've seen it now, we've done seven towns. Um, the need is so diverse. At the end of what we do with 10 towns, you're going to have a list of so many different issues in this country yep. that um, are very localised. It's not that you've got this one thing for the whole of the country. The CWA are doing a lot of work that people don't hear about. And, you know, obviously tonight you've got an amazing woman on um, from the CWA, but also a recipient. And, you know, they're the stories that are so important to us. Jerry and I cannot be out there with 25 million people saying, where should this money go? Um, so the CWA's always been very close to my heart. Um, they do a great job. Katie wanted to run the CWA when you, I first met her, I know. You can't keep repeating the same thing. The good story. thing is, though... It can keep the wearing the same shirt, though. Yeah, yeah, but the good thing is um, the number of women that are now joining the CWA oh. that previously didn't, and so there are people listening to this tonight, they're watching, and, and they're thinking, maybe I'll join the CWA. I, I, I'm in this country town and I can be... A, I can be I can be somebody that's doing something for other people. And, and if you're not doing anything and you would like to join the CWA, they, they love to have you as a member and you're just another person out there trying to do something for other people. It's the community and, you know, what you're trying to do is say to Australians, this is a fabulous country we've got. Go and spend your money locally. Correct. So on top of that, you've got communities like Broome where you've got these people doing such fantastic work so, you know, between us all, we come together and do this and um, there's no better place to live, work, 
bring up fa bring up a family than Australia and all of these places. Bloody yeah, it is a, it is a pity when people do go out of their towns to buy, or they buy you know from overseas online sites and all that. I, I know you've got to buy a bit like that, but every time you do, think there might be another job in Australia. Bloody and, oath. And so, uh, and I might be doing someone else a favour if I buy in my own country, you know? Katie, Jerry, thank you very much for this whole project. Got a little bit more to go this year and fingers crossed next year as well. Thank you very thank much, you. guys. Appreciate it. Give it up for these guys because Katie Page, Jerry Harvey, 20,000 people who work for them in those stores around the country and so many in regional centres. What they've done for the CWA as well has been awesome this year. A quarter of a million bucks. Now, as you know, I am a rev head, I mentioned it before, but I also was reliably told by somebody in the audience before, there's a 24-hour car wash here in Broome, so all signs of me doing wheelies on the beach will be gone. Gone. All of that will be fine, so when I return tomorrow and just throw the keys and run at the airport, it'll all be fine. But those who are more than happy to get their cars dirty are people who are trying to replicate what Peter Brock did some uh, 40 years ago, when he, of course, was driving around the country in a rally car and have a look at the rev heads, the Holden rev heads that we met uh, just a couple of days ago. It was long, exhausting, but legendary. The 1979 Repco Reliability Trial. From the beginning, it's uh, just a question of surviving. We don't know really what's in store for us up in the north and in the west. A two-week, 20,000-kilometre trek around Australia. Three, two, one, go! Starting and finishing in Melbourne, the trial went to Adelaide, the Flinders Ranges, Perth, Darwin, Cairns, Brisbane and Sydney. It was tough and unrelenting. Most of the 167 starters failed to finish and just 13 cars completed the entire course correctly. Peter Brock, at the height of his success as an Australian touring car championship driver, silenced his doubters by winning. Will Rally, none other than Peter Brock. With crew Matthew Phillip and Noel Richards, Brock was the first across the line in an astonishing 1-2-3 clean sweep in Holden's then new and factory-backed BB Commodore. Yeah. Okay, Matt. Now, 40 years later, the trial is back. What we're trying to recreate is a, a catalogue of history for the originals, uh, retracing some of the original roads because some of them are gone. It's a massive achievement for people uh, with old cars. To celebrate the anniversary, the Repco Reliability retrial has kicked off. When you're a car buff or a car tragic, you just take anything that comes along, so this is too good an opportunity. I think a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see 40-odd cars going around Australia all stick it up, celebrating a very significant race that happened back in 79. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's a bucket list thing, this one. Absolute bucket list. Been, been waiting for it for a long time. A 28-day course with special stages and all for the love of cars. In 1979, it was speed and fatigue. Now, it's every night's accommodated. So what you find is you've got people from all over the world. You've got people from Wales, the Netherlands, New Zealand that have come together and been uh, caught up with everyone. Oldest competitor, an original competitor, 81 this week. Barry Ferguson came second in 79. Youngest is a 12-year-old lad from Townsville called Jet Watch. Some are even doing it for a good cause, like this father and son. So far we've raised over $1,500 wow. for Drive Against Depression. That's awesome. So it's a mental health initiative to support um, people uh, battling mental illness that obviously have an enthusiasm of motoring and motorsport and cars. Good enough for Brocky is more than good enough for me. That man is, of course, Bogan God, and 40 years ago is what he uh, did with the Repco Reliability event. You're going to find out plenty more online about that now. Let us talk, ladies and gentlemen, to none other than the beautiful Jessica Malboy. Hello, gorgeous. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? That song was amazing before. Thank you. Well, it's a song about my mother um, and her mother, and I think for a lot of the little things um, that her mother was, you know, I guess not being able to share that with her own mother. So that was um, something that I was able to capture as a, as a young girl growing up and observing my mum and her story, um, you know, that, yeah, that she was never able to have a mother and to lean on and, you know, had to, had to grow up real quick. But yeah. not that I'm doing that TV thing trying to make you cry. Yeah. But 
I've seen you've been quite emotional performing that song. Yeah, um, I think too because it is a personal story and it's something that I've never really shared and it's been bottled up and I've, you know, performed a lot of colourful songs like Pop a Bottle, like Inescapable, um, really kind of vibrant songs that really fun my, uh, share my fun side and my happy side. But there are things, you know, I guess in my personal life that, you know, I'm opportunities that I've never been able to share. So this is really the perfect time. I turned 30 um, a few weeks ago and it's just, yeah, for the last six years I've been kind of building um, this kind of craft about my, my family and things that I've, I've kind of shared in my own personal moments by myself in my room, um, you know, on, on, on this kind of journey that I've had for the last you know, more than 15 years yeah, with music. I have this deal with myself where any time you sort of think, oh, work's getting a bit weird or frustrated yeah. or someone's having sort of a <laughs> bit of a knack at you, mm -hmm. go, if I could talk to sort of 15-year-old me yeah. and say, hey, when you're, in my case, 41, being able to say, hey, when you're that age, you'll mm. be doing this, you'll go around the country, have a TV yeah. show, it becomes pretty easy pretty quickly. Yeah. If you're able, after turning 30, to go back and have a chat to 16-year-old Jess, yeah. would she be There's... pretty stoked to know what you're doing? Absolutely. I think beyond, I think, you know, big dreams, definitely, for sure, um, that... Um, you know, that I've been able to capture and, and experience. I mean, things that, you know, I, music has been able to take me all over the, all over the globe, um, whether it's writing, uh, writing it, whether it's performing it. Um, it. It's, yeah, it's pretty magical what music, uh, the healing that it, ha that it has. Now, really. let's talk about this incredible venue because <laughs> you've got history here yeah. where, um, you know, uh, you premiered a movie here mm -hmm. and no red carpet. It yeah. was the red dirt that they walked you <laughs> on. What was it like to have a movie premiere here? It was pretty special. I mean, the story itself, Brand New Day, um, I mean, the original, the musical um, by Jimmy, yeah, by Jimmy T. Like, I just, there was something really powerful and I remember even auditioning for it um, and I had Rachel Perkins who was such um, a lovely mentor throughout the film um, and such an incredible cast. I mean it was so colourful, it was so uh, vibrant and, and the music um, really spoke you know, um, the way Brew moved and, and, and how colourful it was and, and you know body language um, you know was a really huge thing um, you know with making Communication. It was like, you know, you kind of look at someone down the road and, you, you know, you do one kind of hand and that means a lot of things. But <laughs> for them it was either like, hey, or you got something or... Um, but, yeah, the, it was so colourful in the way that um, culturally, um, I mean, language even, um, and, and the people of, of, of this community, of this town... Um, and what it meant to everyone was was huge. The response was incredible, and still people are like, I still have little girls come up to me and say, you know, I watch Brand New Day. Yeah. That's my favourite movie, and yeah, it's just it's unbelievable. And um, yeah, I'm so proud that uh, at at, the, at that time too, I was releasing my very first record called Been Waiting, and I'd never done a film before. It was, um, it was the very first time I'd done anything like it, uh, and I just kind of dove into it you know, read the character Rosie and she was just so sweet and lovely and, you know, that's kind of like, you know, one of my other sides. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, she was just... <laughs> He's saying there's good Jess, bad Jess, there, young there, Jess, old Jess. There's good and bad in everyone. Yeah, correct. Just, it depends on how you, you know, Which when Which Jess wakes up every day. I get it. Don't worry. There's many moods with yeah. Paul. Mostly angry. But generally, I can slice out the odd smile here and there. You know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but, but, that, 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 but also, that experience, to be able to, as you say about those little girls, right, mm. to be able to see yourself on the big screen, such yes. a big thing, a story like that as well. Um, let's talk about Sony Foundation as mm. well, because this is the charitable side uh, to, to the music operation that Dennis yes. Hadlin's put inside for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Those little faces that yeah. light up when you get to see them, it never gets old, does it? Never. And, and you know, and these, these kids, families especially, um, you know, are going through um, so much hardship and struggle and pain. I mean, watching, you know, your son, your daughter go through so much pain with cancer, um, you know, is... Yeah, is you know, I'm sure a very difficult thing to go through. Um, trying to find the funding, trying to find the money. Uh, you know, where are you going to stay whilst you're, you know, in and out of doing treatment? These things, um, you know, and I guess what the amazing thing about this foundation is closing that gap. I mean, you have such a teenage, you know, um, level of teenagers that are, 
you know, going into real adult um, wards mm. and, you know, not and, and finding it really difficult, uh, you know, to be to be there um, and to be amongst their ages, really. And so it's, you know, I feel it's very much a part of my job to go in and, you know, and help raise money any way I can, whether it's going to the camps, whether it's going out there and, and asking the, people for the money. That's it. I've seen you perform yeah. at, 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 like, yourself and Guy mm. and doing so much charity work. It's, it's such a credit to you. Thank and you. I've seen you perform in a place sort of full of sort of Sydney wankers all yeah. sort of sitting there, not looking <laughs> Look around, at... not talking, you know, <laughs> and then yeah. sort of after the first verse, even if they, they, start, to, yeah. they start to really move to you, and, and that's a phenomenal talent to be able to hold a room the yeah. way you do. Thank um, you. Good luck with the album Thank a bit so later in, in the year as well, and to bring those, uh, that ray of light into kids as well. Last one here, yeah. Broom Time. What does it mean to you? Broom Time. Um, it's about just... I, you know what? It's slowing down. It's going with the pace of everything, I guess. Um, it's yeah, reminding you to take take a moment, have a breather. Very cool. All right. Well, we're on broom time tonight, but we're still going to get to some ads every now and then if we kind of feel like it. Is that is that the vibe? Just you know, <laughs> roughly when oh look, we'll get to the ads now. That's probably a little too uh, a little too broom timey. I've got to be a bit TV show here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Jessica thank Malboy. You. Thank you, my gorgeous girl. Thank you, darling. Quick break. She'll be live on stage in a second. Plenty more here from Broom. Don't go anywhere. I'm telling you, you need to see the staircase to the moon. We'll tell that to you next. This program brought to you by NAB, Australia's biggest business bank. NAB, more than... For watching, um, look, uh, God love Rob, who's helping everyone when to clap and when not to clap. And the instructions were, this is just a really short clap, guys. Thank you to everyone in the audience. You haven't been bossed around this much since you were at school. And I appreciate it that you're here. All right, everyone, I want you to, completely organically, but as loud as you possibly can, welcome back Jessica Malboy! <laughs>
Thank you, Jess. Jessica Malboy. Uh, she is, thanks to the good people of Sony Music, she will have an album out in October, and we'll tell you about that on the show when it happens. Now, let's learn more about the Country Women's Association, what matters in Western Australia, what matters here in Broome. And we've got two lovely ladies, uh, one of which I had the chance to uh, hang out with at the Broome Cup, and one I've had the chance to meet this afternoon. And both are as wonderful and radiant as any sunset or sunrise that happens here. Uh, please give it up for Sarah Kenny from the CWA in WA, and uh, Sarah Good uh, Sandra Goodsey, I apologise, darling, uh, who is a nurse, but she's so much more, and there's so much more that she does. We'll get into all of that in a moment's time. Thanks for coming along. How good was the Broom Cup yesterday? How good was that? But I didn't win anything. <laughs> wow, well, wasn't it fabulous? It was fun, wasn't it? Yes, and I loved you to spoke to the man when number six was going to win and number six won. Well, this is, so he'd be very oh, happy. Oh, yes, he but would. I, we spoke to a lot of people, including that lady, a lot of beeping, a lot of beeping that we needed to do uh, the... Well, the stuff that we couldn't quite show this evening in front of this polite audience. We'll show you to you again tomorrow night as part of Paul Murray Live as we are in Perth tomorrow. So, Sarah, let's talk about um, what the CWA does in Western Australia. What's some of the stuff that you cover? What are some of the, the, the needs, big and small, that, uh, that you help out with? Wow. Well, now, you've really got me started because CWA is just a wonderful organisation for women. It gives so many opportunities for friendship and fun and connecting with your community and giving community service. And that really is our aim, to give something back to our community. It gives women of all ages so much purpose in their lives to be making a useful con contribution. Even, even when they're a little bit older, I know, I called in at the office to pick up some things to bring to Broome and there was a sweet elderly CWA member who dropped in because her group was making little tops for King Edward Hospital. And she couldn't help them the day they were making them, so she'd called in a day early to spend the day cutting them out. So our contributions are tiny and they're huge. We lobby government, we've had a rally at Parliament House. Now, you've had things where uh, there's also a series of, of, of scholarships mm -hmm. and this is where Sandra comes in here, right? Uh, tell us a story about the connection between yourself and Sandra and, and what she did to get that <laughs> $5,000 scholarship. Well, CWA offers lots of scholarships for um, secondary education, tertiary education and we're known as a really ethical group in handing out money, so the Commercial Travellers Association also had some money. They've teamed up with CWA to provide, it's called, the Henderson Field Scholarship for a nurse who'd like to further her studies in some area. And when Sandra's application came into the office, hers was just shining, so there was no... No hesitation in giving the scholarship to Sandra. So let's talk about the Deadly Sisters, uh, the Deadly Sister project, and what you've been able to to do with that. Well, um, Deadly Sisters is run by the Wirrapunda Foundation, and that started by David Wirrapunda, who's an ex AFL Eagles player, and it's a mentoring program for young Indigenous women. So every Tuesdays, I go into St Mary's College here in Broome, and I work with a group of Year Seven girls. So this particular group, um, a girls there, um, had a few issues with confidence and self-esteem. Now, I did a road trip in May and the day after the road trip I got back, I heard of a, a second suicide in Balgo, which is a town 900 kilometres from, from Broome. And the town is 350 people and within a spate of seven weeks, two young girls have taken their life. And, I just burst out crying and I thought, how am I going to connect Brain with Balgo? How do I stop? How can we stop young girls and, and just young people in general taking their life? Because it's this thing where regional communities are such a problem, remote communities yeah. even worse, uh, Indigenous remote communities. We talk about this a lot on the show. Um, and the truth is, is that in, in, in the major media and media conversation, it's a real eat your vegetable stuff because people are distracted by this celebrity this or this celebrity that or this supporter. Yeah. But this is the stuff that shows how we care for each other, yeah. where those things fall down and how we can do a whole lot more to do that. So I, I, I want to get an insight about, say, what does $1,000 do for the CWA in, in WA? What could you do with $1,000? Well, it's a scholarship, <laughs> isn't it? If we're giving it to Sandra, mm. it's just about one of her trips. Mm. And if we're giving it to the other cause, 
which CWA is sponsoring this year. It's the Derby West Kimberley Air Branch mm. Soup Kitchen. That would give them a month just about of food supplies for their soup kitchen. Wow, so $1,000 a month for the soup kitchen and for $1,000 for you, what, what could that do? What, is, what does I that just, do to help you? Well, uh, Oh, look, that would just go so, such a long way. I just drove up to Lombardina on Wednesday by myself to go spend the day at the school. You know, that's $250 of fuel just, just there, and that didn't include every, all the stuff I bought up for the kids. Um, everything comes out of my own pocket. It's... I don't know. Um, I don't know how to quantify that. That would probably be a week of road trip for me to go out to more communities. Um, Yes. But $1,000 goes a long way, right? Absolutely. $1,000 goes a long way, $1,000 goes a long way. Very All right, way. well, let's see how far I can make this go for you. The good <laughs> people of Harvey Norman here in Broome ran a silent auction. They ran a silent auction that relied on the local community to come forward to help the CWA to help your project, OK? And $1,000 will help. Absolutely. But what about $35,000? Because that's the number. Well, my goodness, that is just amazing. That's the number. Fantastic. So when that's you said, incredible. so you said for the soup kitchen, a thousand dollars would keep them there for the month, right? The way they're going to divvy this up, fifteen thousand dollars to the soup kitchen means more than a year of support for them, which means you, my beautiful lady, are getting $20,000. Oh, my God. <laughs> How does this help? Can we help? 20 grand. What does this mean? You get to do more work, see more kids, take care of more girls, right? Sorry. I just can't talk. Um, firstly, thank you, um, Harvey Norman. Thank you, Antonia, Sam, Laura, Patty. Thank you. I, I just don't know what to say. Um, That's... I think we know you're happy. <laughs> I think we know you're um, happy. I'm usually not one to um, be speechless, but I think you really... Wow. Um, well, keep look, doing the work for us, OK? Um, this is going to go so far. You know, we, I can travel up to Balgo, which um, I've already got my dream team sorted who I wanted to take with me. Um, this means being more active. Um, I can actually take it far east to Kununurra, to Wyndham, um, I can get other agencies involved, which is really good because I want to be able to, you know, make sure everyone's co costs are covered, and that's really hard when you're, you're doing this on your own. Now, it's nothing as exciting as the money that, uh, that Harvey Norman have put in place, but I was told as well by Sky News that all of our digital IT people are going to help you build the best possible website you can with the best possible donation <laughs> facility as well, so people can continue to do that, OK? So Harvey Norman have done the heavy lifting, the people of Broome have taken care of you. We're going to make sure that this becomes a permanent thing because what you're doing changes lives, OK? Do we not agree, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Sandra, get on you, darling. I'm going to give her a cuddle. I'm sorry. I'm going to give you a cuddle. Well done, Sandra. Well done. Well done. Thank you very much, OK? Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> Well done. Well done. All right. Thank you, beautiful. Well, we're going to get plenty more information about how you can help. And I know there's a lot of big heavy hitters who watch us all the time on Sky News. We're going to make sure that, uh, that you're there. But the soup kitchen as well. They're set up for a year now. That's pretty the awesome. The soup kitchen is wonderful. They give a hot meal every Tuesday to 60 to 90 people who can't have the opportunity of a hot meal otherwise. So they do wonderful work, those girls. All right. Give it up for the CWA and these beautiful ladies. Thank you. More in a sec from Broom. Harvey Norman. Shop with confidence. Need advice? We're here to help. towards uh, the home stretch here and there's so much to talk about but can I show you this thing I've been banging on about to anyone who'll listen I've been putting it up on Instagram PM off air telling everyone this is if nothing else 
the reason you've got to come to Broome, which is this. It's the staircase to the moon. Have a look at this, right? It's a natural phenomenon where you get to see the moon rise, but as you can see, because the water's relatively flat, as the moon rises, if there is a little ripple here or there, it starts to look like a staircase making its way up towards the moon. But literally, as thousands of people were standing there, I'd never experienced anything like it. Now, I've been around places where, you know, I've been at Times Square on New Year's Eve and people are looking up and excited. I've been, you know, to Sydney Harbour on New Year's Eve. But the experience, and I mean this with everything I've got, the experience of standing and watching this is something that no event planner could come up with other than the ultimate one, that being the person who decides sunrise and sunset. But I tell you what was mesmerising about it was thousands of people who were standing there and watching, and they're all silent. There's no reason why they have to be silent, right? The moon's coming up anyway. There's no question about that. But they're all silent just knowing that they are watching something special. You can only see it a few times a year, and the best place to see it is right here in Broome. So the staircase to the moon is something that I'm sure everyone in the audience here, any chance that they get to take family or friends who are visiting to come and have a look, that's one of the musts, I'm telling you. The natural phenomena. Is, I, 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 this is going to sound like a strange double up here, but that mixture of broom time, natural phenomena and days being focused around the sun coming up or the sun coming down. Feels a little bit like Vegas. A little bit like Vegas without the gambling, the strippers, the... OK, it's not quite like Vegas. All right. Uh... <laughs> I'll move on to something as a better idea, perhaps. Tourism is front and centre as one of the industries that keeps this place ticking along and growing each and every year. Emily Evans has a look at tourism in this place that hopefully you're going to be part of because this is the place to come and see. It's a sight you'd expect to see in the Sahara Desert, but these camels cruise down the crisp white sands of Cable Beach every morning and every afternoon. They first started walking on Cable Beach many, many years ago um, with the pearling industry. They actually got the pearl shell from Willie Creek and brought it along the beach down to the port. In Broome, camel tours are a major tourism enterprise, with thousands of travellers enjoying the dozens of rides available each week. Don't get many sunsets like that in, in Brisbane. We're on the wrong side. <laughs> what was your favourite part? Oh, just all of it. I think just going along the beach, even if it wasn't sunset, it would be still great just going along the beach. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah absolutely fabulous. First time for us yeah. and just brilliant. And I think we've got a real appreciation for camels now. They're just lovely animals, very affectionate and loyal and faithful. You think that might be a dog, but no, camels are pretty good. Australia has a large feral camel population. There are roughly 500,000 of them wandering around the country. But these giants, who call Broom home, are nothing but gentle. But there's more to Cable Beach than this spectacular silhouette. Part of the 22 kilometre stretch of sand is also open to four-wheel drives, allowing tourists to explore the rocks and oceans surrounding Broome. On the tip of Cable Beach lies Ganthium Point, a photographer's dream, where the Kimberley's red dirt meets the sea. The town itself is also a hive of tourist activity. Broome's pearling history is everywhere you look. Two old pearl luggers are on show in the centre of historical Chinatown, while pearl shops are in abundance. Cafes and restaurants line the main street, often full of visitors from April to October, when the warm weather acts as a warm welcome to people from around the world. More than 269,000 people visited Broome and its surrounds over the last three years. 53% of those visitors were West Australians travelling in their own backyard. When the sun goes down, the town comes alive. Sun Pictures is a popular choice, the world's oldest outdoor picture garden attracting many to watch a movie under the stars. Rocking down the street last night, and there's the sun pictures. And I said, Hello, 
I'm always going to go there, so here we are. Sometimes the planes would come yeah. over. Yeah, yeah, over it, yeah. And at special timings as well. Oh, it's a unique experience, I think. Uh, you know, the, uh, the the balmy evening, the stars, the plane, uh, the planes overhead. It's just an amazing place. It's just like walking back into history. It's just yeah. incredible. The theatre has been operating for more than 100 years. It survived the bombing of Broome in World War II and lived through racial segregation. The decades of history entrenched throughout the building. Local Doug Fong lives next door and remembers watching films from his window. When I was a kid here, you'd get a picture that was maybe five years old, if you were lucky. The old-fashioned cinema is in the heart of town and over the last century, it's captured the hearts of tourists and locals. It means quite a lot to a lot of people, particularly old people like myself who've been around for a while. Uh, it's just one of the things that's part of Broome, part of Chinatown. I hope that it goes on forever. It's just such a special place. So good. And by the way, like... Last night, they were showing the brand new Quentin Tarantino film. And uh, the, so if you want to see the very latest in a very unique fashion, you make sure that you can come here to Sun Pictures and, uh, and so much more that's here in Broome. Let's talk about tourism, how important it is, and well, some of the wilder things you can do. A little further up the road that you go, let's talk to Chris Ma, Robin Ma, who are from the Unique Kimberley Travel Specialists. Hello, guys. How are you? Paul, how are you? Lovely to see you. And Paul McSweeney is the CEO of Broome International Airport. One and all. Hello. Hello. I've got to ask first with you, Robin. Um, tell me about what it's like to, to, to run a business this far away from any major capital city? Well, um, because it's a tourism and travel business, it's, it's easy. We've got the product, we've got the environment and there's so many wonderful things that you can do here. Well, it's this thing too where, I mean, this region, but what you do particularly, it must be a little bit funny as you look back over the years at how people have, have interacted with things where, let's be honest, 20 years ago, OK, they take the cameras out a lot and take some photos. Now, I'm sure there'd be generations of people who don't even put the camera down. And you go, look up, this is pretty amazing, look at it with your own eyes. Yeah. But is this not the most... Instagrammable location in the world. Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Like, Absolutely. it's just, you look around and, and the majesty of things around the Kimberley are, are, are incredible. How do you work out how to get access, how to keep access, how do you make sure that it's respectful? What's that like? Well, I think um, people are coming to Broome for um, more than just doing donuts in the beach pool, <laughs> even though that, must, that would be really good fun. It was fun for me. People are looking for a, a, you know, a, a really more authentic experience and a way of engaging um, with, a, with a town. And this town has got so much to offer, and the history is extraordinary. So people are finding ways to engage with that history. And it's very easy uh, in travel to do that. Rob and I just recently started a, a, a small bar walking tour around this precinct. Yeah. The, this precinct has just been revitalised. That wouldn't have been possible a year ago, but now that um, the China town revitalisation has happened, it's a very easy and popular thing to do. Because it's that thing, isn't it, where, where Paul... I mean, the, the, the airport is such a great facility and it's one that obviously links you to the rest of the country, but seamless, easy, wonderful little gateway to not just Broome but the entire region. Exactly, and I think one of the things that's very unique about our airport is it is right in the middle of town. And, um, and I still get a lot of enjoyment out of watching people who are new to Broome walk down the street and a 737 flies virtually overhead. <laughs> um, but it does make it very easy to get around Broome uh, once you've landed. It's that thing, when you talk about the walking tours, and uh, what, what are the main ways that you like to show off this, this city? Uh, well, we use this little micro, micro projector, actually. So as we're walking around Chinatown at night, we can... Um, Really? You just beam, up this, yeah, yeah. this, this? That's yeah. awesome. Beam up uh, images on, on, uh, on, on shop building faces. And there's a, a fantastic um, pearling timeline down on Dampier Terrace and it, and it takes people through the history of Broome. Mm. And there's two really unique years we love to focus on in that tour. One is uh, 1901 when Australia federated. Uh, and then, um, but in 1901, Broome really had a, a great population of people from Japan, China, the Malays, were all here working in the pearling industry. Mm. And only a few months after Federation Australia in introduced the White Australia policy. And then 1902, um, the, the Pearling Association uh, got an exemption from the White Australia policy for Broome, the only place in really? Australia. So that, 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 that year is the key year that helped help make Broome what it is today. Because it's that thing, Robin, where, I mean, it's just so self-evident. I mean, in the audience tonight, walking around, I mean, you know, 
Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, they all want to carry on about how multicultural they are. Uh, Broome was probably that way before. Yeah, definitely. And it's a great way to see Chinatown. Um, it's very social. We stop and have a drink and eat along the way and um, we get a lot of visitors and locals, so they like to connect and talk about, you know, what they're doing in Broome and how they came to live here. And, yeah, it's a, it's a fun tour for us as well. It's very social. So who are the types of people who, who want to do something like a walking tour of Chinatown? Um, every demographic. You know, from um, young people to older people, staying in caravan parks, world-class resorts, backpackers, everyone. Mm. It's a fun way to see Chinatown. And, Paul, um, how many aircraft come in and out of Broome each and every year? The idea that, yes, the 737s are rocking around all the time, but it feels like there's an awful lot of little planes that are coming and going too. Yeah, well, Paul, I can tell you that we have about 35,000 aircraft movements a year. Blimey. Uh, but only about 5,000 of those are the, are the big uh, jets coming and going. Uh, so the Kimberley is very reliant on air travel. Um, we would have about 80 small to medium-sized aircraft based on the airport. Fantastic. Uh, it just goes to show how reliant the Kimberley is. During the wet season, you often can't get through on the roads and things. So it's not just the big jets that come and go, it's also uh, general aviation and the reliance on, on that side of aviation as well. So as a bloke who, uh, you know, uh, last time I checked, aviation kind of needs to stick to the old clock every now and then, uh, but broom time's a little unique. So I want to ask all of you, what does broom time mean to you, Paul? Uh, broom time for me, uh, and I've had a little bit of time to think about this, we're watching tonight. <laughs> broom time for me is just taking that time to do the little things in life. It might just be a walk on the beach or might be I'm going shopping, but it takes half an hour because you run into 10 or 15 people that you know and you, you stop and take the time to see how they are. All right. So that's broom time for me. All right, and if people want to know what you guys think is broom time, they've got to come and uh, do a tour, do a walk-in tour, all right? All the details up on our Facebook page. Quick break, back with more Live in Broom here on Paul Murray Live. This program brought to you by NAB, Australia's biggest business bank. NAB, more than money. Beautiful broom, you've got to come and check it out. By the way, uh, the last group that we just had, uh, their little business is called Salty Plum Social Tours, which is how you can uh, walk around Chinatown. Let's talk about some of the great exports in this area and then have a chat to some of the good people who work with NAB. It's very unique in its own self. It's so popular because it transforms the way we see our country. Australia's oldest form of art putting culture onto canvas. You're suddenly looking at the desert and you're seeing this absolute plethora of colour, you're seeing depth, you're seeing layers, you're looking at it from an aerial perspective. Ways of painting landscape that have never been seen. That connects us to um, land and family and culture and stories. Daniel Walbitty is one of the many artists based in the Kimberley. The father of two prefers to paint in the small community of Bijidanga, almost 200 kilometres south of Broome. Everything I need is there, my family, my partner and my two daughters, my culture and um, language and the land itself where it provides for us. Some pieces take the artist up to two months to create, but once completed, Daniel's artwork is sold for thousands of dollars. The stories and the history behind the art attracting buyers from around the world. They must understand that it's not just a painting that you can put on the wall, it's our culture that we're sharing and our land that we're sharing. And it comes with a history and a story that's connected. Oh, but um, sort of gives some people understanding of who we are, where we've come from, and where we'll continue to go. I think it's a great advert for Australia because you see this majesty that is our country.
But it's this glossy treasure that cultivated the town into what it is today. The humble pearl was once Broome's largest export and has deep roots in the region dating back more than a century ago. While the local industry has now focused on tourism rather than the beauty itself, the pearling history will forever remain. But beautiful artefacts are not the only high-priced commodities in Broome. This liquid gold is well known across the nation. Well, I think it puts Broome on the map a little bit, um, gives us some recognition up here in, in Little Broome Town. Matzo's brewery and the beers it creates are as unique as they are quirky. The chilled brews infamous in the region and inspired by Broome's surroundings. You know, the mangoes came from the mangoes dropping down in the courtyard out here every November and um, thought what can we do with those and put them in the beer and it tasted great. We also have a bit of fun like mixing the beers up with mango and chilli, chango over the bar and stuff so you can have your chilli to taste. Matzo's began as a microbrewery making only 200 litres at a time. It's now an empire with beers available around the country. Oh, it's a pretty amazing story actually, we're pretty proud of it, like we um, didn't expect it to ever get as big as we did. The business now produces roughly 230,000 cartons each year and the original brewery based near the mangroves continues to reel in customers from around the world. And what's your favourite beer? Um, mine's the pale ale actually, but, uh, but I do love a mango after, especially a like, hot day out in the sun. who put so much effort into the story of this particular area. Now, let's welcome, uh, from the NAB, Libby Greenwood, who's the uh, General Manager for Retail here in Western Australia. Hello, darling. Chris Mitchell is a councillor here at, uh, at Broomshire Council. And uh, Andy is the owner of uh, Bali High Resort uh, and Spa at Cable Beach. Did I get it all right? Excellent. Good. The notes can go. Hello, everyone. All right. Um, how important is, uh, is Western Australia to, uh, to the NAB and what types of things are unique in business in a place like Broome? Yeah, so Broome is a very important part of our, our network in Western Australia. Um, and let, if I can just say from the start, we know that Broome has been through some tough times recently, but what we absolutely know is that Broome people are tough, they're resilient, and as you've said before, they absolutely, they absolutely have a spirit. So what we're hearing um, is that we've absolutely been through the worst of things and we're coming out on the other side. And as we speak to, to locals like Andy, who have been here a long time, we know that they take a longer term view of things um, and, and they speak to the boom and bust that Broome's been through in the past as well. Is it that thing, Andy, where... I mean, I've asked everyone all night about Broome time and I'll ask you about it again a bit later, but is, is that also part of the Broome time calculation, which is, look, it's not all about this minute, view as a whole, take a couple of years to know whether we're truly up or down. Is that fair? Mm, it's still difficult for people because they've got to be able to get through it. After the global financial crisis that hit us in 2010, a lot of small businesses in Broome didn't make it through. So um, uh, you never know what the future's going to hold and uh, you've got to put a few bucks away for a rainy day. Um, but in a remote town like Broome, it's, uh, it's risky. Small business is risky. And... Well, and I couldn't help but think that, obviously, everything has to be brought here. Now, no different than anywhere else in the country, but it's a whole lot further to bring things. When you run a business, how far in advance do you... I mean, how long does it take for stuff to get here? Well, it's not as bad as, as all that, you know... Probably the more the bigger issues are the cost of tourism and transport, and you know the airlines are doing their best to reduce the prices for us in the off season, but still it's fairly high in the peak season. So we, you know, we uh, we really need um, the governments to sort of help out the towns in the north, and I think you know promote cheaper airlines to fly from major centres in the well year round. Really, we don't have one discount airline flying into Broome uh, for the whole year from any major centre. And so that's, that's more of a... Uh, in my industry, that's more of a, a uh, you know, 
a question that we've got to answer. It's a good point. Well, this is the thing. I mean, from North Queensland now to Western Australia, there have been regional airlines, the cost of which, the idea that you can... Well, you're not bankrupt yourself, but you can go close to it if you need to get to, to, to Perth, in this case, for specialist things. From a council perspective, I mean, I never forget five years ago, I'm standing at Mount Isa, I'm standing on a, a, a lookout, and you go... I can't even imagine where Brisbane is from here, um, let alone where Canberra is from here. And you get that sense of broom. We say, well, I can't imagine where Perth is from here and I can't imagine where Canberra is from here in terms of the decision-making. So, effectively, local council becomes government. It becomes um, the touchstone, the touch point for people to be able to have a tangible face to put on government, not just an MP. How does administering an area like this, what are the opportunities, challenges... Excitements. Yeah, there's, uh, well, there's heaps of opportunities and there's a number of challenges as well. But uh, from a council perspective, um, we try and lobby as many ministers, both state and federal, as possible and try and encourage the federal ministers to come over here. As you say, we're a long way from anywhere, over 2,000 kilometres from Perth um, and the same uh, over 1,000 k, no, 2,000 k's up to Darwin. So our closest neighbours is, is Asia. So, um, but... Um, the pl Broome's got so much potential and it's about harnessing that potential and making it happen for, for everyone and um, the Shire's got some great projects happening for Broome and the Kimberley region but um, it, it, there's opportunity for a lot of new investors in town. And, and Libby, uh, how much do you want the NAB to be the people who help facilitate those opportunities, turn hope and dreams into realities and with the ability to, as Andy says, put some money aside for when it mightn't be the best of seasons. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we want to be here for our customers in the community in those boom times and when, as Andy said, when times aren't as good. And it's important that we understand what's going on in the ground. We have a local team here. We're really listening to our customers to understand what we can do to walk side by side with them and make sure we're really supporting the momentum that we see happening in Broome now as well. Really important. Yeah, it's this thing where, Andy, what's, uh, as a man who's got a place where I want you to be able to book, come and see him here, um, yeah, all year round, certainly this time next year, um, the family's going to be back for a whole lot longer than just four days this time. Um, why should people come to Broome? Why do you want them to come and stay with you? Um, need the money. <laughs> you know what? That is the most honest answer ever. It's going, it's my business, I want to sell rooms. Nah, Paul, thanks for giving us a plug. That helps all of us. Of course. Well, it's a thing. Well, all the details yeah, will be up on our but, um, website. But, yeah, t tell us about why yeah. Broome is that location rather well, than going to Asia. Um, the icon is Cable Beach. And it'll be probably one of the most photographed beaches in Australia and one of the most stunning, especially this time of year. It looks great. Uh, people are friendly. Uh, good community spirit, people like Chris, not only on the Shire, but if you've got a snake in the yard, he'll come and pick it out and <laughs> take it back. That's a good councillor. I don't think my local councillor would even uh, return the call, let alone take a snake out for me. <laughs> yeah, but people, they do look out for each other in Broome and uh, it's friendly, relaxed. And between May and October, probably the best weather Spectacular. Uh, on the planet, really. Well, mm. mate, if this is winter, I want winter. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, one and all. I do appreciate it, and also the support of the NAB has been amazing to us in our town. Good on to you, to Libby, and the entire team. Thank you very much, guys. I do appreciate it. Time to say goodnight, sadly, uh, from Broome, but let's say good day to everyone who uh, has been kind enough to join us here this evening. Thank you very much, one and all. Thanks very much. I hope you've had some fun. Have we had a good night? We're, we're going all right? <laughs> thank you to Jessica Malboy. Thank you to the great uh, people from Harvey Norman, the wonderful people at uh, Australia Post and Sony as well. So many people have helped us out along with the National Australia Bank. Also, this incredible technical team who've been able to turn uh, a more than century-old picture theatre into a television studio for the night has been pretty awesome. We cannot wait to keep our town on the road. The next location, I'll announce it on Paul Murray Live tomorrow night. One and all from Broome, thank you very much. And come and visit the joint. Ta-da! <laughs>